This week, bending the rules, breaking the rules, and cleaning up the mess. again, we head on our annual pilgrimage to the world's biggest mobile event, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. The stands are filled with an array of gleaming rectangles, but on the whole, they look quite similar, on first glance at least. Well, there are plenty of great phones here, but mine does a lot already, so would I really want to upgrade just for a slightly bigger screen and a slightly better camera? Well, probably not, and it seems that plenty of other people are in agreement with me. Two of the biggest brands, both Apple and Samsung, have seen sales slow down. But where there has been innovation, like 5G or foldable screens, the prices are eye-watering. Huawei showed off its Mate 10, which has an 8-inch AMOLED display. When we saw the device fold, it was a wow moment. The screen is thinner than rival Samsung's, as the company proudly pointed out, most of the components live to the side. With no release date yet, it did feel very much like a concept phone, though. We were told to keep our mitts off, but on a brief moment of holding, it did feel a little weighty. But if you're loving the idea of getting that extra real estate on your phone, but you don't want to indulge in buying a full foldable, will LG have a dual display? Although it will initially be sold as one package, it's actually a phone case that has a second screen as part of it, allowing you to maybe play a game with a separate control pad or simply message a friend your location with two apps open. But if you don't want to fork out thousands on your device, then this is what's happening elsewhere. As always, camera functionality is where everybody is trying to make a splash. So the back of the devices are adorned with an increasing number of lenses. The Nokia 9 PureView really went for it, though, with five cameras, two colour and three monochrome lenses, all working in unison to capture an image so the focus can be changed after the fact. Some devices attempt to do this with the help of a depth camera, but the results are less precise. And it's been all about minimising the notch, that black bit at the top, to provide an unobstructed screen. Samsung and a Huawei up the ante by introducing the discrete punch hole, which other manufacturers will no doubt follow soon. Another illustration of how hard it is for big players to stay ahead of rivals like OnePlus. This is their latest model, and it looks and feels pretty much like one of the high-end phones. It has facial recognition, almost an edge-to-edge -edge screen, and it has a fingerprint sensor built into the screen. But this uses an optical sensor instead of the more premium ultrasound sensor seen in the latest Galaxy S10. And more Chinese brands are expanding into the West. Xiaomi started selling its handsets last year, and Oppo showed off its latest high-end device. I do believe this is what you have been waiting for. Oppo's first 5G smartphone. As the market gets more crowded with similar-looking phones, the battle to cram in more functionality continues. The second iteration of Microsoft's HoloLens created quite a stir here. It's lighter than the original HoloLens, but at the same time, it sort of feels more solid. Let's see what the experience is like. There we go. Our 
After a brief setup, I found myself working in construction, albeit of the mixed reality variety. The upgrades include an improved display, doubling the viewing range, adding voice control and more precise hand gestures. They allow you to stretch, rotate and move what is in the virtual world. Or, as was demonstrated at the launch, do something as detailed as play the piano. Or I can play the keys one at a time. The view is wider, but the experience is definitely better when I'm standing further back, which initially when I was trying to move things on the table, obviously that wasn't ideal because I was having to go forward. But right now, I can move the time scale just here to take a look at how the building work was going at each point. Okay, that's pretty cool. This still isn't a consumer product, though. It's squarely aimed at professionals with a price tag to match the $3,500. So all the demos are of this nature. Well, whilst it's easy to get caught up in trying to get the knack of the gestures, the visuals are actually quite amazing. Microsoft wouldn't say if its future plans include a less pricey consumer version, but speculation was rife amongst the crowd that HoloLens 3 could find its way into our homes. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week that Facebook took down the page of anti-Islamic activist Tommy Robinson for violating its policies on hate speech. It also removed his Instagram profile and said he would not be allowed back on the platforms. Elon Musk's tweets landed him in hot water, again. Regulators in the US have asked a judge to find him in contempt of court after they said he breached an agreement from last year to have his Tesla-related tweets vetted in advance. And the BBC and ITV have announced plans to launch a new subscription-based streaming service. Called BritBox, it will contain archive content from both broadcasters as well as original commissions. It was also the week that two companies unveiled just what we need. New military drones! Yay! Weapons maker Kalashnikov announced a new kamikaze drone that explodes on impact. Meanwhile, Boeing announced it's developed a new jet plane-sized UAV codenamed Loyal Wingman which I'm sure is intended to be reassuring. FedEx is the latest firm to trial a new autonomous delivery robot. Based on technology from powered wheelchairs for disabled people, the delivery company claimed that the same day bot can navigate unpaved surfaces, curbs, and even steps. No word as yet though on its capacity for sorry we missed you cards. And finally, do you have trouble sleeping? Have you always craved a robot pillow that breathes like a baby? Then you're in luck. Dutch engineers have created something to fill this particular niche in the market. Somnox weighs as much as a cat, it also plays music and aims to calm your breathing. Sweet dreams. Away from the show floor, this week Nick Quek has been talking rubbish, but at least he went to sunny Dubai to do so. Dubai. The Persian Gulf. Year-round sun, scorching temperatures. Eh, uh, not exactly the weather I was hoping for. Bit of winter sun, they said. Ah well, despite being soaked to the core, the show must go on. In these unsuspecting waters lingers a cunning creature. A wide-jawed, wading guzzler on the hunt. Meet the Waste Shark. This aquadrone sails around marinas and coastlines, scouring the surface for plastic waste, debris, seaweed, and other pollution. And it's off, setting sail on a mission to gobble up as much garbage as possible. It essentially works like a giant Roomba vacuum, hoovering up floating rubbish in its path. The Waste Shark is the world's first autonomous uh, marine waste and data collection vessel. 80% of waste that reaches the marinas, the marine environment and the ocean is from the land. So we need to approach the issue of marine protection and ocean sustainability from multiple angles. So this trash sucker 
It's designed to patrol the marina waterway for up to 16 hours before the battery inside requires recharging. It's actually designed after the whale shark, its big mouth being able to suck up 200 litres of trash at one time. Its black plastic zip-tie teeth keep bits and bobs inside its mouth, handy when needing to reverse. Three independent thrusters control the shark's direction and speed. This current model is actually being remote controlled by its captain on the pier, but other models have LiDAR sensors on them, allowing them to autonomously navigate waters. They also have a collision avoidance system aboard too, so they can detect nearby objects and, if necessary, move out the way. There are big trash skimmers that are very expensive to buy, to operate, they use fossil fuels, they don't reach into hard to, to reach places. It's not the only waste eater that's cleaning up waterways. Over in the US, the Baltimore-based Mr. Trash Wheel sucks in and processes heaps of rubbish. So far, it's cleared well over 500 metric tons of the stuff. And in Chicago, the inventively named Trash Robot is another remote-controlled rover tackling pollution. Designed by Dutch partner Ran Marine, the Waste Shark is just one of the solutions being used by EcoCoast to improve Dubai's waters. The company has also deployed bubble curtains to prevent silt and other contaminants left over from construction reaching the ocean, a real problem due to Dubai's ever-evolving landscape. The bubbles behave like a barrier, restricting the movement of floating and subsurface pollution. For us, what's very important is what solutions will prevail in the future. You'll have pods of way sharks that are cleaning the waterways that are autonomous, that are self-charging, self-emptying, and they're constantly feeding back data to the, the end users. Gathering data on water quality and areas of high contamination could help marina owners and local governments record and know more about the state of their shores. Dubai Municipality has just adopted two that will begin patrolling public waterways in a couple of weeks. A noble effort, but with an estimated 8 million metric tonnes of plastic ending up in our oceans every year, it's tough to see how these tiny trawlers will make much of a difference. But at least for now, bottle by bottle, it's helping us protect our planet. Back in Barcelona, I was once again surrounded by 5G signs, same as previous years, but this time it really felt like the tech was a lot more ready to make its mark. A few 5G-enabled phones are hitting the shops this year, but 5G is not really about a faster connection for our mobiles. It's more about connecting the things that were never connected before. Stands were full of ideas about what that could mean for the future. A robot that can instantly mimic its driver's moves. Imagine this happening when they're thousands of miles apart. And this is the kind of collaboration that 5G promises to unlock. Wearing AR goggles can let you interact with the same 3D environments, but without the kind of uninterrupted connection 5G should provide, the experience will always fall short. So frustrating. This collaborative game is set up on Wi-Fi at the moment, the reason being to demonstrate how the haptic feedback is a little bit delayed, whereas once it's on 5G, well, it should all be happening at the right speed, exactly as I do things. Although I don't think it's going to improve my skills. And it can truly unleash the power of AI. We already have AI capabilities in our devices. Image recognition, for example, helps to enhance our photos. I played a simple game which shows the speed that our devices can recognise objects in an image. I'm really trying my best here, but no matter how quick I feel like I am, the computer's a lot quicker. The only thing is, at least I get it right every time. If you pull it all together with 5G, uh, suddenly you have a very, very highly performant device 
that is connected to the cloud with a very low latency so you can actually have almost immediate responses based on where you are, uh, your context, and that changes the way your device interacts and what you can do with it. For example, if you were actually going out on a run um, and you actually now, your phone is capable of not just giving you canned exercises, but training as you go along that is tuned to how your body's responding to it. 5G might make the relationships with our phones a bit more personal, but on a grander scale, the entire travel infrastructure around us could be transformed. This is part of Millbrook Proving Ground, a place where cars and their components are put through their paces. But right now it's serving as a testbed for 5G and what that could mean for autonomous and connected vehicles. Whilst 4G radios still need to be used at the moment, the rest of the trial sees movements and interactions tracked on a 5G network. It replicates what could in the future keep traffic safe and well managed. A number of cars today have SIM cards in them. That will evolve into um, algorithms that help those sensors connect. I think the really key thing is how are you going to use the data to be able to help make the end user's life easier. And that's what's being looked at here. Can we get the uh, vehicle to be connected? Can we make sure that we're transferring the data? Can we do that in a safe and secure environment so that the data that itself is secure? Then can we make sure that the cars themselves are secure from each other, but also are they secure from unexpected events? The much talked about low latency aspect of 5G means no delay. And that is of course vital when we're talking about moving traffic. This McLaren is traveling at 160 miles per hour. Within a 200 metre radius, the cars would be able to wirelessly track each other too. Even here, it feels like there are a lot of vehicles moving very fast. But of course, in the grander scheme of things, these are just a few. We're looking at all of the vehicles on all roads being tracked in this way. And that is a big job. When we talk about millions of devices to be connected to the network per kilometre square, when we talk about cars, homes, streets, hospitals, factories, what we have exploiting here, the technology, is parallel computing and parallel signal processing. So we have a large number of processing units in parallel, do the number crunching in a minimum amount of time. In terms of AI, when we talk about automation part of the 5G, when robots are connected or devices are connected, uh, AI plays a very important role in terms of understanding what the device wants to do or what the device should be doing and forecasting and predicting in future. But if all of these vehicles and all cars on the road are relying on that mobile phone network, what happens if it goes down? Well, I think what we do as a mobile operator is we continue to look at um, our network. We did suffer an outage with one of our partners and that, and that, was, that was quite public. Um, we're looking constantly at how we can make sure our network is more resilient in the future. And I think one of the things that will come out of here is how do we make sure that the vehicles themselves are resilient from a network point of view. Before we reach a state of fully connected autonomy though, 5G could have its work cut out on road and rail, providing more accurate live tracking and information. We know that from some of the work we've done on our Smart Cities report, that from a train transportation point of view, rail sensors uh, working on preventative maintenance could take out 440 million of lost productivity. And that equates to about 2.6 hours per commuter per year of time saved. And then from a road point of view, having a, real, uh, a really good connected 5G road management system could help take out 10% of time waiting in traffic. And that, you know, for our 5.6 million commuters on the road, that would be a real saving. So many phones, so many promises, but do they all live up to what they're offering? Omar Metalv's been putting one to the test. This is the AGM A9 smartphone. It has features that you'd expect of many top brand devices. Quick charging, fingerprint ID, a big screen, but it's also quite solid. 
Now this phone isn't for your average user. It's designed to survive the toughest of conditions. So tough in fact, that the company say that it's unbreakable. AGM advertised their phones as being able to survive quite some punishment, such as being able to be kicked like a football. So we asked the company if it could survive a hammer. They said yes. Ah, right. That didn't take much. Right. That's broken. That is smashed. But to be fair, maybe it wasn't designed to actually take a hammer to it. It's gone completely. Okay, okay. That's just the screen. It's easily replaceable. No problem at all. And the back of the phone was proving a lot tougher. So I got some help. Oh, be careful. Oh, yeah. And don't try this at home. Okay, you've got. <laughs> you've cracked the plastic. I think Look I did that. it. <laughs> oh, it's lifted completely. <laughs> so despite saying that we could use a hammer, AGM came back to us and said that the military certified phone can endure a lot, being waterproof, shockproof, dustproof, but a hammer will compromise it. Look at that! <laughs> oh, so he broke the camera lens while well, I couldn't, but yeah, a long way off from unbreakable, like the company said. Omar Bear having a smashing time, but you don't need to go that far to disconnect. So how about this? A phone which will keep you connected when you need to be, but doesn't provide all of the distractions of a smartphone. Now don't think that this is just a basic device that can't do much. The idea is actually that it's a premium product. It has up to 270 hours battery life, BlackBerry security, and a rather bold price tag of £295. The company anticipates it'll be bought by those who already have a smartphone, but fancy the option of some calmer moments. Well, that's it for the MWC special. You may not be able to do it on here, but if you want to keep track of the team throughout the week, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching.